Welcome to the channel. Today, we're going to be settling the battle between Team Red, Batmobile, versus Team Green, George Foreman Cooler, and seeing who's actually better and who comes out on top, ultimately. Raw performance, no fake frames. No, actually, I have something way cooler than that. These are just some old GTX 480s, ATI Radeon 5870s, that I think have really cool cooler designs, and something that the graphics card market's missing today. Ultimately, what we will be discussing is building out my own home lab. Welcome to Tech Driven, my name's Danny, and over the winter, I've been building out a home lab, and you could do something as simple with a basic Lenovo one liter computer with a ton of RAM and a, and a decent amount of hard drive space, and then ultimately going out to a NAS to have a home lab. It's wild. There is so much you can do, but I'm gonna show you how I built mine, and maybe take some inspiration to build it out yourself. Let's do a quick explanation of why you'd want to build a home lab. And well, there's a lot of different reasons you'd want to build a home lab. I'll go over the reasons why I did, but the main ones would be, you know, learning new IT skills. It could be anywhere from virtualization, storage, networking, security. You know, there's, security is huge right now. And if you're looking to get into IT or you're looking to move your career somewhere in IT, I would say security is really a safe bet. Someone's always gonna get hacked nothing is ever secure and learning tools and learning pen testing tools and becoming a white hat hacker is very beneficial and it's something that i've kind of thought about moving my career that way and enable and then building out this rack can enable that form but you also don't have to go as extravagant as building a 12 u rack with a shit ton of nazis and a big ass server you could build something as small as this or even running vms on your own personal laptop or desktop as long as you got enough ram and cpu cores you're totally fine. Great example would be also, if you don't have enough hard drive space, you could do something as simple as a desktop Synology NAS, an external hard drive, which is fine. Ultimately, I would recommend that you at least get a NAS with two bays and you mirror those drives. So if one fails, well, then you don't lose your data. Like the instance that I had for years, and I'm gonna show a dirty secret of this channel way back. I mean, and if you guys are long time, long term viewers, that have stuck around for the gajillion years that this channel's existed and stopped and then got going again and then stopped and got going again. These were the hard drives that held all the data for the channel, period. There was no backups. They were individual drives that sat in my PC and it scared the shit out of me, but I could never afford to have a Synology at the time. These work great as a storage solution and you could use that not only as a backup location, a place where you can keep all your data, but also where you could put all your VMs from, let's say your VM host on there to run. So it's really, really cool. There's a lot of things you can do. The learning possibilities are endless. Yes, you could use AWS, you can use Azure, and you could to go with the cloud, but you own it. It's your data on your, in your house. You don't have to pay someone monthly to have you know, 50 terabytes of storage, you own it. And I think that is the best part. And now let's show you the rack. And also I got two dead hard drives I mentioned earlier, and I don't even, I'm not looking forward to replacing those. Those are $300 hard drives. Well, let's do a quick rundown of the rack. Like I said earlier, you do not need to build something this extravagant that uses this much power. And this is 100% overkill, but I think it's super cool. Ultimately, you could do everything on this and use a desktop NAS and you're good to go. Um, this is a premium cables rack. It's pretty decent. It has some downsides. Um, unfortunately, like the rack bent from the casters being on carpet. They did warranty it and gave me new sides, which is great. So 
big plus for that. Um, Price-wise, this was like $150 Canadian. It's a super cheap rack. Um, it's a little on the short side, so I couldn't use the rails. The servers are kind of all stacked on top of each other, which isn't ideal. It does include some shelves, so you get um, a 1U shelf and a 2U shelf that I actually have in the closet. And I mounted, moving on to the hardware that's now in it, we mounted the switch in the back, and I'll show you that later. But the reason I did that is because, you know, all the Ethernet cables and everything's in the back, and it keeps the front of the rack very clean. And my goal was to keep all the cables within the rack, and if I ever needed to move it, I just unplug the Ethernet cable that feeds it, and the Ethernet cable that goes to my main PC, and the power to it. And then I could wheel this at literally anywhere in the house. Um, I mean, as long as it didn't have to change floors. Um, then we have my main Synology NAS, which is 24 terabytes usable storage. So this is a RS-1219. This has 24 terabytes of usable storage. This is where I store everything, edit off of um, primary NAS that I use. So this has the first level of my data. Then the next NAS, this is a RS3614. Uh, now this one is all SSD storage using WD one terabyte red SSDs. Don't have a plan for it just yet, but maybe what I'll do is you know, do some benchmarking of seeing, is it faster to edit and render off SSDs versus the spinning disk? Probably yes. And versus maybe editing on an SSD on my local machine directly off SATA. So I think that'd be pretty cool. Um, this NAS here is the one that I mentioned at the beginning of the video that actually had two hard drives die as I powered it up today. It has 50 terabytes of usable storage in a RAID 5 configuration. This one's 10 terabytes of usable storage in a RAID 5 configuration. So if you're kind of keeping track, um, there's a lot of storage here. Um, and I'm using RAID 5 across the board until we get to the Think server. Um, this one I don't have a use for, but now it just broke itself. So I got to fix that. The 6 terabyte WD drives it uses are about $300 to $350 a pop. So they're not cheap. So I guess I'll have to buy two of those. But we'll see if maybe reseeding the hard drive gets them going again. And that would be awesome. But if it doesn't, well, I'm kind of SOL. The last NAS is actually my backup replication NAS, has about 40 terabytes of usable storage. And this one ha actually replicates everything off of this NAS. And future state, it's gonna replicate all the VMs off of the Think Center and the Think Server to this. So that's the ultimate backup endpoint, right? So that's gonna be the backup endpoint. This has four terabyte Synology drives in it. Um, there's definitely a mix of hard drives through here of Synology and WD and, and SSDs. Uh, moving down to the very end, we have the Think server. So this is an RD640, 2U server. And this has, I actually changed out all the drives on this. But let's talk about some uh, CPU and RAM. So this has 160 gigabytes of DDR3-1600 ECC memory. So ECC is error correcting memory. As well as it has dual Xenon E5 2670 CPUs with a total core count of 32 cores between the two CPUs which is not bad, but it's also not like a ton nowadays. And you consider modern Threadripper and AMD Epic CPUs and even some high-end Ryzen CPUs. Even the high-end Intel CPUs have high core counts that, you know, it, this hardware, sure, it's cool. Dual CPUs are pretty cool, um, but it is old. And has 160 gigs of RAM. I can't remember if I mentioned that earlier. For hard drive configuration and the RAID setup, the first two hard drives have swapped out the old 120 gig SSDs that were mirrored to one terabyte hard drives. Um, so now we have one terabyte mirrored for the OS. So that's running Proxmox as the uh, hypervisor that's gonna be running it. VMware has gotten ridiculously expensive and I believe they got rid of the free ESXi. So I said, you know what, let's try something I've never used before. We're gonna give Proxmox a try and learn it. So that's a great use case of this. We're trying new technologies that I've never used before and expanding my knowledge and applying um, basically those skills I've learned from VMware and Hyper-V to Proxmox. And then also as I, you know, hit bumps in the road and got to go figure it out and learn new things. Um, I built a second data store with the rest of the hard drives that these used to be one terabyte hard drives and now they're two terabyte hard drives and I have a usable uh, six terabytes of space. And these hard drives are in a RAID 10 configuration and the RAID controller would not let me do anything other than RAID 10. So that's what I did. As well as this box, you can remotely turn it off, turn it on with the remote management console, which is pretty cool. So that's always on, but I can turn the server off at any time through a web browser, which is really nice. Um, but overall, that's kind of the rack. And now let's show you to the back of the rack. So let's take a look at the back of the rack. We'll do a quick overview here. You can see the switch with all the cables, my PDU, 
all the NASs and ultimately the server at the very bottom. You can see how I kind of routed all the, the power cabling together. So coming from here, and then this one was kind of opposite, which was weird, um, slightly different model. Grouping them all together, including the server under the rack, bundled them all up in the rack, kept them in the rack, out, and then to my PDU. So the PDU connects to the wall, supplies all the power, and everything runs happily. Now I should add that this PDU is a surge protector, but it does not offer battery backup solutions. So if the power goes out for me, this whole rack is gonna shut down, which is not good. Ultimately, you want a battery backup. You can either do a rack mount one or a desktop one. It's something I'm looking into right now, but they're about $400, $500, so they're not cheap. So I'm gonna probably try to look for a used one. And that's pretty much how this whole thing came about. So a lot of used hardware. We got the 48 port ubiquity switch here. Um, very, very nice. So this group of four ethernet cables is just the uh, RD640 and the pink one is actually my PC. The white one is going back to the main uh, Rogers modem. And then we got SFP uh, there, which is what we're gonna use for the 10 gigabit. We got a lot of free ports. Now this group of ports is gonna be set up as teamed NICs for each of the Synology NASs. And that's why I grouped them over there and I'll can reconfigure the, NA the switch to, ha uh, to enable that as long as well as on the NASs. So that's gonna be pretty cool. But right now they're just configured with uh, two IPs. We have, like I was saying earlier, the PDU where everything plugs in. We have each of the Synology NASs with dual power supplies. Now the server only has a single power supply. You can see it. We got room for one more right here. We got all the ports for the server back there, video out for VGA, which isn't really needed now that Proxmox is running and I can just connect to the web console. But check this out. So I got, you know, oh, one of my power supplies died. Oh no, boop. And then it just beeps at you. And it still runs. So it's still happy. It's, well, it's not the happiest camper, but right now it's beeping at me saying, hey, dummy, go plug that power supply in. Or my power supply died. Wink. And we're back. So pretty, pretty cool. It could run off one power supply, but it would prefer to always have two plugged in for maximum redundancy. And that's really the benefit of running hardware like this. This top one only has one power supply and it's a little bit more home business, but it's um, you know a little higher end, but not as nice as the lower units, which are considerably bigger. And then look at the length. And this is why I was saying this premium cables rack is good, but it's not perfect. You know, If I had a proper rack, it would be much longer and be able to use um, these style holes for mounting everything. And then I can use the toolless uh, rails and be able to slide all the hardware in and out. Right now, if I was to get something out, it's probably a mission. But overall, the cabling is really nice. Everything is uh, pretty, pretty cool. And uh, let me take my mic off and you can have a listen. It's pretty loud. Well, that wraps up today's video. And that was a great overview of the rack and everything I've built right now. This is just the foundations of building a home lab. Now, what I've built is completely overkill and this hardware is all used and was destined for the destruction and I've given it a second life and really just recycled old hardware, which I think is the best way to build a home lab. Take an old, take an old Windows box, convert it into a VM host and build out whatever you want. Take, you know, a use Synology and make that your primary storage. There's so many things you can do. Um, my plans, like I said earlier for this, is to not only improve my Windows server knowledge, start improving my window, my Linux knowledge, as well as network and networking and security. So I'm gonna improve with building up that PFSense um, firewall and improving all of that. So there's a lot to be learned and a lot to do here, but building it out on my own time, on my own pace and learning in an environment that I can't screw things up. And if I do, well, it's, it's up to me to fix it and I'm not affecting business, which is great. So. It's a great, safe place to learn and build and uh, really improve your skills. And that's the biggest benefit I kind of want to drive home with this, uh, with having a home lab. It really enables you to learn and kind of play with it more at a hobby level, which actually makes working on this a little bit more fun and making me kind of get back into computers in a way that it was more of a hobby than just work, because really working in IT kind of ruined it in a way. Um, but. Overall, if you guys want to see a part two, that will be coming eventually. 
um, uh, as I have updates. So stick around, like, and subscribe, and we'll see you guys in the next tech-driven video. Hi, Tony.